Hello everybody, I'm uh, Luca Giussani and uh, I'm a software engineer at Horizon Labs working in the Proving System group. Uh, lately, the Proving System group has uh, taken a deep dive into the world of uh, ZKVMs and so I'm really excited to let's say, share what uh, I've learned along uh, the path. And so uh, what I would like uh, to talk about is uh, first, okay, what it is a ZKVM, what are the, its uh, main components, and uh, how it's used uh, in practice for what it can be used. Uh, and then to, let's say, dive a little bit more into the internals of uh, ZKVMs, so how memory handling can be implemented, how coprocessors can be added to a ZKVM, and then briefly hint at other ZKVM components which can be added, like the storage or cross-program calls, and uh, then briefly see some of the existing projects uh, implementing ZKVM in practice. So, uh, let's start. What it is a ZKVM? First of all, it's a VM, so it's something which can uh, run uh, an arbitrary program written, written in some uh, Turing-complete language, just like a normal VM, but with the added bonus of producing, at the end of the computation, a cryptographic proof that the program which was fed in input to the virtual machine was correctly executed. And, uh, okay, why this is important? I think mainly for uh, two reasons, let's say. First of all, because uh, uh, the fact that this is a VM and so it understands a, a normal, let's say, programming language, this opens up the ZK, uh, ZK proving to a much wider user base. Until very re recently, to actually do anything in uh, the proving, uh, proving system space, let's say you had to be almost uh, a cryptographer, let's say, and you had to deal uh, with uh, low level uh, con uh, write, uh, writing of constraints and so on. Uh, ZKVMs have the potential to change this, and uh, so uh, writing a program for a ZKVM will, uh, will feel like writing a normal program in a normal programming language. And so, uh, why this is important? Because uh, it can lead, it's a, let's say, a very promising, promising path to uh, tackle uh, blockchain scalability issues, even in uh, blockchains which support uh, smart contracts, because smart contracts are, let's say, programs written in a Turing complete language, and so uh, having a ZKVM would uh, uh, allow to uh, prove the correct ex execution of this program. This would uh, give a whole new meaning to, let's say, the mantra of blockchain, which is don't trust, verify. At the moment, it's not really like that. It's more don't trust, re-execute. But this change, this is like a paradigm change. And uh, so now will be don't trust. Someone has proven the correct execution on some, of something and uh, all the others just have to verify. Uh, okay, so this is the context in which we are. And uh, let's see more in detail how ZKVM workflow looks like. So like uh, uh, all, basically, the proving uh, system, the prov proving system, there are three steps in uh, producing and verifying uh, a a proof of a statement. For each st statement we want to prove, there is a setup phase, and this is run only once for each statement uh, 
for each kind of statement we want to prove, or uh, in this context, for each program for which we want for, uh, to produce a, a proof of correct execution. And so, okay, our user, let's say, writes his program. Then this program gets compiled into some bytecode, which is the language uh, which really the ZKVM understands. And then there is an additional phase in which this bytecode is fed to a hasher, for lack of a better word, uh, which uh, produces like a ID of the program, something which I, uh, uniquely identifies this program. So a fingerprint of this program, which is later used for being sure that the correct program was run. Okay, so after the setup phase, for each statement we want to prove, uh, we basically feed the bytecode and uh, some possi possibly some additional input to the ZKVM. The ZKVM does its magic and uh, produces both an output, like a normal virtual machine, but as I was saying before, also a proof of correct execution. Uh, loosely speaking, what is the statement of this proof? So the data, the public data is the program ID, so something which uniquely identifies our program. The uh, output of uh, the program, and the private data is instead uh, the input which we fed to the program. And then statements uh, goes like, uh, I know some private input W that if fed to the program identified by, our, the, by the ID, gives Y as output. Uh, so this is the proving phase. And then, and, uh, okay, the proof is uh, for each statement we want to prove this is performed once. And then this proof can be independ independently verified by everyone, basically. Uh, so the verify, a verifier algorithm takes in input the program ID, the output, and the proof, and checks if the, the proof is valid. If it's valid, then it gets accepted. If no, it uh, gets uh, re rejected. Uh, okay, here, of course, the advantage of this workflow is that proving a program can be quite computationally demanding. While uh, verifying it, it's very fast, can be done in just literally one millisecond. Uh, and so this enables uh, what I was uh, telling before, uh, uh, a whole new level, uh, let's say, of uh, scalability in uh, blockchain. Uh, okay. In this uh, slide, uh, the ZKVM is a black box. So now I would like to enter a little bit more into the structure of basically every ZKVM that uh, we have seen. Uh, and there are two components of a ZKVM. There is a VM runner, which is uh, what is more, uh, uh, we, uh, which is uh, ne nearest to uh, what we think, uh, what we, uh, I mean, uh, of the normal concept of a VM. So it takes an input, uh, a bytecode, some additional input, and it runs uh, the program of uh, the bytecode and produces some output possibly. But uh, what distinguishes a ZKVM runner from a normal VM, it's that during the execution of the program, the ZKVM, the VM runner, takes uh, a track of the state of the VM at each step and produces uh, an, what it's called an execution trace. An execution trace is just like a rectangular table of uh, numbers, actually of uh, uh, field elements, but that's just a technical, uh, uh, technical detail. And uh, okay, each which we can think of each column of this execution trace uh, as a register of our virtual machine. So here I put uh, like the clock, the program counter, and then a 
set of M register which depends on uh, the uh, architecture which we chose for our VM. And okay, and then each row is just a snapshot of the state of uh, the virtual machine at each uh, clock cycle, let's say. Okay, why this execution trace is useful? Uh, because the idea to prove the correct, the correct execution of a program is quite simple, actually. The idea is that if we start from a valid state and we end in a valid state and uh, we pass from a valid state to, uh, from uh, the initial state to the final state always with a valid step, then we can be assured that execution of the program is uh, correct. And that's basically what uh, the Stark prover does. So we must supply these air constraints, which are polynomial constraints, because every proof system uh, works with uh, polynomials. And uh, these polynomial constraints so encode what I was just saying. There are some boundary constraints, which are only enforced on, uh, let's say, the first row, or zero row, and the final row. And these are polynomials in uh, W variables, where W is the width of the execution trace. And these enforce correctness of initial and final state. And then there are some transitional constraints, which are polynomials in two times the width of the execution trace. And these are evaluated on each pair of consecutive uh, execution trace rows. Uh, if all these polynomials evaluate to zero, then we can be sure that uh, the execution trace was genera generated in a correct, honest, let's say, way. And that's what uh, the Stark prover uh, does, producing so a proof of correct execution. Uh, okay, now, uh, I mean, I would like to talk about memory handling uh, because, uh, okay, this is a nice picture, but uh, of course, a ZKVM must have some memory because our programs would need to access this memory to do anything uh, useful. The problem is that, uh, okay, this memory cannot fit entirely in, inside the execution trace. Why? Because just to implement a tiny amount of memory, let's say one megabyte of memory, would require to add on the order of one million trace columns. And this is clearly unfeasible uh, from a point of view of performance and memory occupation. So the solution is actually quite simple and uh, inspired by, let's say, real hardware. So the memory lives outside our CPU, which uh, we, we can identify our ZKVM with a CPU, basically. So memory lives outside. And uh, however, CPU interacts with memory uh, with read and write operations. OK, what's the catch is that uh, uh, being uh, in a provable context, we, we cannot uh, trust that me memory behaves honestly. And so all the read and write operations are coherent, but we must somehow enforce the correct behavior of, uh, of memory inside the air constraints I was uh, citing uh, before. Uh, OK, let's see how it can be done. I don't know if in the last <laughs> rows you can uh, read. Uh, okay, here it's an example of, of uh, how we can uh, represent memory transactions inside an execution trace. So we have uh, the first row is the cycle of our VM. Then we have a second row in which we have the address of uh, the uh, which is involved in uh, this memory transaction. Then we have a third column, which is a Boolean uh, column, uh, in which there is a one if the operation is a write, 
and a zero if it is a read operation. And then we have uh, the last column, which is the data column. Uh, and so uh, the semantic of this column is if it's a write operation, then it's the data which is written to memory. If uh, it's a read operation, it's the data that we are reading from memory. So let's go uh, through some of this row. In the, at cycle zero, we are uh, writing to memory address number three. Uh, a value, the value 17. Then at cycle one, we are writing at another address, so address seven, uh, a value three. Then second cycle, we are reading from address three. And uh, of course, having previ previously written 17, we read uh, again 17, and so on. Uh, of course, we want to ensure that the read and write operations are coherent. So in this example, we would like to enforce these uh, constraints on uh, this pair of uh, rows. So data two should be equal to uh, data zero, because as I've explained, uh, we have written some data to uh, address three, and later when we read from there, we want to find the same value. And similarly for the other uh, two constraints. What's the problem? The problem, as I was saying before, is that the transitional constraints can only act on consecutive rows. But here, memory operation, depending on the logic of our program, can be separa separated by an arbitrary number of clock cycles. So we are, uh, it seems, in a bad position. So what's the idea to solve this problem? The idea is to add, an add to our execution trace another set of four columns which are to be populated only after program execution is complete. Uh, and how do we popul populate them? We populate with the same, basically, uh, data uh, of the first uh, uh, table, but in which the rows are reordered. How they are reordered? They are reordered first by address and then by cycle. Uh, what's the advantage of doing so? The advantage is basically that now all the operations uh, acting on the same memory cell, so the same in which the address uh, field is the same, are together, are together and are in a chronological order because they are uh, uh, ordered by cycle. And so now imposing the constraints I was showing before is much easier. Ah, of course, uh, uh, the fact that, uh, uh, okay, this is a technical detail, the fact that uh, this table contains the same information of that table only with uh, rows reordered is enforced via a permutation argument, which uh, DDT was uh, explaining yesterday. Uh, but then uh, the main point is that now uh, these constraints, thanks to this reordering, only act on consecutive rows. And so uh, that's the bre bread and butter for transitional constraints. Uh, and uh, actually, these constraints can be uh, expressed uh, quite easily. Okay, I won't do a delve. Uh, into much details, but these are the constraints which on this table which enforce memory correctness and they are basically imposing that rows are ordered first by address, then by cycle, and then that uh, if uh, data is not, uh, if uh, the, uh, it's not the right operation, then data should not change. And here you can see that these constraints only involve data at, uh, let's say, field at uh, step n and step n minus one. 
so can be readily encode, encoded in uh, transitional constraints. Uh, okay, so that's how memory can be implemented inside the ZKVM. Then uh, let's see how to add the coprocessor. Okay, what's the problem here? Is that, okay, although, although uh, a ZKVM understands a Turing complete uh, language, and so every kind of computation can be expressed in the language which, which the ZKVM understands, it might not be the most efficient way to uh, encode all the algorithms. There are some, let's say, computationally heavy algorithms that uh, uh, would be quite, uh, quite uh, heavy to uh, run uh, natively inside the language of the ZKVM. For example, hash functions, uh, signature verifications, also rank checks. And so the solution is, again, <laughs> inspired by real hardware. So the idea is to process this uh, specialized operation outside of the CPU in some specialized single-purpose single execution unit, which we call in this context uh, coprocessor. It's like, uh, I don't know, uh, if we think about uh, floating point operations, uh, it could be possible to, uh, let's say, program them as a software, but nowadays these operations are offloaded to a, uh, let's say, to a specialized arithmetic uh, unit. And so the idea here uh, is the same. Uh, but of course, like in memory, we cannot trust uh, the outside processor to behave correctly, so we must somehow enforce uh, uh, the correctness of their behavior. Okay, then there is the problem of how to trigger these uh, specialized uh, coprocessor, specialized uh, constraints. Uh, the first approach could be just to introduce a new instruction in our uh, instruction set. Completely feasible, but it has some uh, disadvantages. Okay, it bloats the instruction set, then for each coprocessor requires to uh, modify uh, the instruction decoding, both in the runner and in the constraints. Uh, requires to modify the compiler, and so breaks compatibility with uh, existing uh, toolchains. And then uh, to access uh, the coprocessor, you, the user may need to add some inline assembly inside uh, its program. So a feasible approach, but comes with its disadvantages. Another approach, instead, is to use uh, what could be seen as memory mapped input output. So, okay, we want to do a heavy computation, let's say computing a SHA hash, for example. So we split computation into two parts. One part happening inside the ZKVM, so in, which is proven by our ZKVM, in uh, the VM lingo, it uh, computation uh, happening in the guest, which is a trusted env environment. And then there is part of the computational <coughs> computation which is performed outside the VM. So in the host, which is untrusted environment, nothing uh, happening in the host is proven directly. Okay, these two environments communicate through memory. So we reserve in memory, a one cell basically, with in, in, which is indicated as a general purpose input output, input output pin, uh, uh, which is uh, the mechanism for, for, for the guest to communicate to the host that it needs the service, let's say, of the coprocessor. And then we reserve an area of memory for writing descriptors. What is a descriptor? It's uh, just uh, a structure which uh, holds all the data which are necessary to perform the computation. For example, in uh, the context of a SHA hash, it could be just a pointer to the, to the beginning of the data to be hashed, the length of the data to be hashed, 
and uh, a pointer to uh, the place in memory when, where uh, we want to store the result of the computation. Uh, okay, and uh, okay, the host environment constantly, uh, let's say, listen to the GPIO pin for write operation. Okay, that's the framework, and let's see how computation goes. So the guest, uh, okay, allocates the descriptor with all the needed data for com ex executing the computation inside the uh, area of memory reserve reserved for descriptors. Uh, and then it signals to the host by writing to the GPIO pin that it needs uh, to access the service of the coprocessor. Then execution passes to the host, which, okay, sees a write to the GPIO pin, then it, he knows that he must read the descriptor. So now he has all the data, or he can fetch all the data uh, from memory, which is needed to perform the computation, the hash, for example. So he performs this uh, computation and then knows how uh, where to store the result in memory. And so just write in memory the result. Then execution goes back to the guest, which can read the result of computation from, uh, from memory. Okay, let's recap what happens from the point of view of the guest. From the point of view of the guest, all uh, is, uh, he has done has been writing some data to the descriptor to okay, describe what computation he, he would like to perform, then writing something to a pin, and then magically he can read the result in memory. Of course, here nothing constrains the result to be the correct one. But for the moment, the guest trusts and carry on with uh, computation. Uh, possibly he uh, makes further invocation to this uh, coprocessor with the exact same uh, mechanism, let's say. But then at some point, computation, our program, will come to an end. And at this point, there is some logic in the virtual machine which triggers this uh, uh, custom coprocessor. So this custom uh, single purpose constraints which are engineered to efficiently verify that indeed the result written to memory are coherent with the data uh, written in uh, the descriptor. Again, the advantage here is that these checks are not done with the general purpose constraints of uh, the CPU with all the overhead that this uh, uh, imposes, but are done with custom uh, single purpose constraints. And this uh, allows uh, to save uh, quite a few clock cycles. Okay. Uh, of course, no machine is uh, complete without some uh, storage. Uh, okay, here I only briefly hint at, uh, how store, secure storage can be added to a virtual machine. First of all, it's important to implement storage because this allows to make the ZKVM stateful and is required, for example, to implement uh, smart contract storage. And so uh, we can think of implementing uh, uh, this storage uh, uh, using uh, some Merkle tree. And so read and write operation to the storage are checked uh, via Merkle path proofs. Of course, then the devil <laughs> is in the details, but this is the general idea. And then uh, we would also like to implement cross contract or cross program calls. Uh, and the idea here is, okay, the guest asks for uh, some program by referring to it by its unique ID. Then the host uh, loads in a non-deterministic way, like we have seen for memory and uh, for the coprocessor. Okay, it loads the required program into the guest memory. 
then the guest can check that the program loaded by the host is indeed the required program uh, by checking, uh, by recomputing basically the ID of the program, and then it can uh, uh, run the loaded program. Uh, okay, now I would like to make a very brief tour on the existing ZKVM implementation. I have to say that, uh, okay, ZKVMs are a hot topic now in uh, the proving system space, and new projects are popping up uh, like every month or a week. Uh, so the one I'm most acquainted with are Cairo by Starkware, uh, Midden by Polygon, and Risk Zero by the company of the same name. Uh, so I would just like to uh, give a brief overview of, the, of their feature, respective features. So, uh, in Cairo, uh, Cairo has a custom uh, instruction set which has been uh, tailored to be air friendly and uh, also only supports uh, the Cairo language, which is uh, still a custom language made for just for uh, this uh, ZKVM and uh, has, uh, let's say, a quirky memory model, which is non-deterministic, continuous, uh, read-only, random, random access. Okay, all these, uh, the fact that uh, they've chosen to implement a custom instruction set uh, to constrain the memory model uh, allows for a, a quite efficient uh, virtual machine, and this reflects in the width of the execution trace, which on, it's only 51 columns for Cairo. Uh, then there is uh, the Maiden project, which has a, let's say, similar philosophy. So using a custom instruction set, uh, a custom language, actually Maiden doesn't offer even a high level language, but only low level uh, Maiden assembly. So a user would have for the moment to write programs in this uh, very low level uh, language. Uh, and okay, Trace with, uh, it's still not clear because some constraints still are missing. But uh, this, uh, this project promises to be a very, very efficient uh, ZK EVM. Then there is a risk zero, which takes, let's say, a quite different path. So they implement a re real, let's say, instruction set. Uh, which is a uh, risk five. By, by real, I mean that's uh, really implemented in uh, hardware. Uh, and so uh, this choice allows, for example, to support uh, uh, mainstream programming languages like Rust or C++. The memory model is the like uh, usual read-write uh, random access with the some non-deterministic quirks, let's say, uh, which allows to uh, what we have seen to implement coprocessors, uh, storage, and so on. Okay, uh, all this, uh, let's say, user friendliness and uh, generality comes at a cost that this uh, virtual machine is uh, less efficient than the other ones. And we can see, for example, that it has a much wider trace width, and this makes all the proving uh, much uh, harder. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, the trace width, um, does the sort of inefficiency scale linearly? So would that be roughly a little more than three times as inefficient? Um, yeah, that's a fair estimate, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, OK, so this is basically what I wanted to share. And if there are uh, any questions.